Ardath Wynott is an activist and writer who works for and with survivors of state and family violence. She's also a professor of sociology at Mount Allison University and the author of a new book called Insurgent Love, Abolition and Domestic Homicide. The radical, utopian, and absolutely necessary prospect of abolition is on people's minds. As Angela Davis, Gina Den, Erica R. Miners, and Beth Ritchie recently argued in their new book, Abolition Feminism Now, it would be, quote, inconceivable to many even 10 years ago that jail closure, the elimination of money bond, clemency, and compassionate release would be debated in mainstream media outlets such as the Washington Post and lauded in progressive public policy forums as examples of necessary change, but that is what is happening. A deep quaking in the conceptual foundation upon which our carceral, punishing society has been built. And yet, still at the center of that tremor in the social fabric is a concern over safety. How do we do the difficult work of imagining a means of keeping especially the very vulnerable in society safe, rather than using the prison and police to ossify the roots of violence. Insurgent Love is an important political statement on the meaning of this broad global shift toward adopting an abolitionist framework. And so much of the book's critical power comes from thinking in both practical and radical ways about what abolition could mean locally in a province that saw a white man from Porta Peak kill 22 people in an act of mass murder precipitated by an attempted domestic homicide and by a course of relationship with police. Why not, like many others, isn't content with grieving this tragedy and moving on. She wants to understand why it happened, to see the patterns and grasp the roots of the violence beyond easy appeals to ideas about good and evil. This means not regarding that act of mass murder despite its scale as some sort of outlier but instead stressing that there were, once again, too many warning signs ignored in a system of strategic neglect that actually extols white vigilantism. There's no question, she says, that it's tough to be an abolitionist scholar on domestic violence research in Canada. There's not much of an appetite, as she puts it, for non-carceral solutions, but an abolitionist answer might be the only one, despite the fact that it is, it's a hard argument to make in a country that still, like many others, actively, quote, worships and reifies the police and the military as these indispensable sources of our safety. Ardath makes it clear that the reason we need abolition feminism now is that the level of analysis black and indigenous feminisms can offer right now, and the level of prediction, too, as she puts it, means that we don't need to be condemned to the reactionary politics of punishment. As white settler academics, we talk about what it means to be permanent students of these forms of feminist thought that radically reject the system that was constructed to directly benefit us, and how to do this without passively accepting the under-acknowledged and unearned rewards of being an opportunist in academia talking about these things right now. We can move in a totally different direction if we can begin to conceptualize meaningful multi-ethnic and multi-racial solidarity that builds a different world out of respect and reinforcement of difference, different cosmologies, different conceptions of justice and of resistance. And if we accept that we need to divorce ourselves too from a carceral system that dehumanizes people and perpetuates violence, Davis and the other co-authors of Abolition Feminism Now suggest that one of the things we might need in this context are, quote, movement spaces for people, people to learn, to be wrong and unlearn, and to be accountable and change. This idea of reclaiming accountability from an unaccountable regime of state violence and punishment might be the central tenet of abolition feminism. It's a challenging idea that I'm still wrestling with myself and, and will be for a very long time. It's a challenge that I think we should all be confronting, and Insurgent Love does give us, I think, a vital engagement with it in all of its messy, historically rooted reality. So your book, Insurgent Love, Abolition and Domestic Homicide, is um, an overwhelming book in many ways. Like, emotionally overwhelming. It's brimming with insights. It's like politically um, so incisive, but 
it's like explicitly committed to finding an appropriately complex answer or set of answers to unbelievably complex social issues. In the last chapters, especially, you stress that you don't have all the answers, really, and that what you're hoping for is continued movement building and the direct participation of survivors in the abolition and replacement of a carceral state. So you're you're aiming for you know, enormous solutions to enormous problems. And you say that and this is kind of where I wanted to start, like that work um, comes at a cost to a certain extent that, you know, the, the work of um, especially engaging directly with survivors means feeling that, as you say, every door, every window, every relationship implies danger. Um, so you describe getting get death threats, for example, after demanding more informed coverage of Lionel Desmond's acts of lethal violence, um, and you're, you know, demanding that his victims be represented as more than just quote casualties in the killer stories, uh, in the killer story. Um, and you know, so to me, like the courage required to do the sort of work you're doing is, is immeasurable. Um, and I see you in these pages trying to inspire in a way that same sort of courage, not just by sort of trumpeting your own story, but by doing things like encouraging your readers to, quote, give space for any discomfort, you know, right after saying that we, quote, must grieve the person a killer could have been had they not become a killer. Um, you know, you're, you're thanking us for wi being willing to dive into this mess. Um, but there's still like a deep understanding of the fact that people have a threshold for engaging with acts of intimate terrorism, like in the preface to a conversation that you include in the book with someone who was convicted of sexual assault, you offer a warning that lets the reader know that they should skip the section if they can't or don't want to hear what this person has to say about these things. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm starting with this because I wonder how you decided um, how to go about being compassionate toward your reader without allowing us to distance ourselves from what you call the visceral act of killing. Like, was that was that specific warning intended primarily for just survivors? And did you hesitate to offer the chance to skip over the voice of a formerly incarcerated person, given the book's insistence on the inclusion of these otherwise demonized people, um, you know, as part of the conversation? Yeah, so thanks for all the, uh, the kind words about how, you know, how it is overwhelming, the content of the book. Um, and a lot of the decisions that I had to make in writing it, you know, the first decision was, do these stories belong in a book? Is a book the right framework? A book is often, especially a single authored book in this way, the academic publishing format really puts us in this structural position of taking credit for the work of others. That's how academic citation works. So there's a bit of a fundamental power imbalance in the ways in which the voice is usually presented. What I wanted was to try to make the book as collective as possible. And so I've, I offered a collage jumping between personal, reflective narrative, the more auto ethnographic tone, and then some of the more distance and abstract critical analysis frameworks, especially in the second and third chapters with regard to types of intimate partner violence and racial capitalism, because the cost of sort of wallowing in the complexities of homicidal violence is, is real and it's big. And for me, as someone who is working with survivors in community for a long time and working with folks in prisons, I often have to jump between sitting in my feelings about what's going on and then pulling back from those feelings and trying to maintain critical analysis because we can't sit in the feelings 24 seven if this is the kind of work that we're gonna do and then we're gonna collectively work together in communities. So, you know, I think for me, especially, you drew attention to that one spot where I quoted uh, someone who had been incarcerated and, and was working within a community-based rehabilitation program for other men convicted of sexual violence. And, you know, part of my content warning in that section is I've been involved in movements against sexual violence, and many of my students are involved in those movements on campus. And Anger and refusal is a really big part of what makes those movements survivable. And I would say that's what sort of distinguishes the spaces I've been in in community against sexual violence versus spaces against family violence. There's a different affective tone. And we know this in social movements that you know our affect and the way that we collectively experience these emotions together 
really say a lot about our movements and they can be very strategic and very political. And so, you know, anger and refusal for me felt like something I had to acknowledge if I was going to be citing someone who'd been convicted of sexual violence, especially sexual violence against a minor. Um, because I think that also that feeling of anger and refusal, I want to acknowledge it. And I also think it's rational and I think it's fair in the context of those movements. Mm-hmm. And I think that I think it requires every reader to, to negotiate their own thresholds as they're moving through it. And so for me, as someone who's trying to bring so many disparate stories together while also paying attention to my own experience, having you know, lost a friend to intimate partner homicide and then another friend to being incarcerated for that crime, um, yeah, I think that threshold is sort of constantly moving for me too as the author. So you know, I hope that the book at least provides freedom of movement for readers so that we can sort of chart a course through it, finding the spaces, you know, jumping from the ice flows that make sense for them so that we can get to the last chapter, which is really about, okay, now what do we do collectively in our homes and with our peers and in our institutional spaces to try to make a difference? I mean, that was my experience of the book. Um, you know, I, I felt that movement um, through, yeah, different registers, but yeah, different um, methods and and different approaches. And I want to come back to how I guess you're sort of like playing with the book as a format or or, or trying to um, unravel what a book can do. But I wanted to, I guess, um, set things up to some extent by by talking about the way that the mass shooting that began in Porta Peak, Nova Scotia, cast this sort of shadow over the book. Um, you know, it seems to me you're offering some of the most lucid, uh, comprehensive analysis, intersectional analysis that I've read of, you know, how and why that massacre occurred, uh, and what was so profoundly flawed about the response to that event. Uh, you talk about why, from your perspective, it feels wrong to name the shooter, which I won't do here, uh, explaining that misogynistic media often spontaneously or consciously characterizes these men as sort of larger than life and disregards their victims. And, you know, in many ways, that nightmarish event is representative of the sort of blindness about the roots of violence that you see plaguing the public response to these alarming moments of violence more broadly. You note that the shooter had a fetish for police, that he was known to have a penchant for using brute force, that he was intent on protecting himself and his property against an existential threat. Um, And you talk about how telling it was that you know the Halifax-based journalist, activist, and poet L. Jones was attacked for just identifying the connection between the shooter's spree and state violence, um, as the province was trying to basically collectively forget uh, through this militarized spectacle. You know, while we had a a high-profile open letter calling for a feminist lens into the ongoing public inquiry into the spree shooting, which has not been public really at all, there seems to be no real room for your, what you're trying to push here, you know, like there's no room for a consideration of an anti-colonial, anti-racist lens. That seems much more difficult for the public to sort of integrate it, it, at all. At all, And I, I wonder what it would mean to integrate a real grasp of, as you put it, the subjectivities produced by occupation when it comes to this particular moment in Nova Scotia's history. Yeah, the, I mean, the... Po- the Porta Peak shooting was a really difficult one for those of us who try to do critical intersectional and abolitionist work on gender-based violence and on gun violence because this place that we're living in, the unceded territory um, of the Mi'kmaq people that you know we occupy, that settlers continue to occupy, is steeped in the British colonial tradition and British colonial sensibilities around how we reify military history. I mean, I have family members who do dramatic reenactments of military battles in their spare time. And I would say that, especially in parts of rural Nova Scotia, there's an ability to be feminist in sort of a second wave, single dimensional way. Um, But of course, criticizing police when police were credited with quote unquote, saving us from the shooter was a really emotionally tricky thing to be able to do. And so Mm -hmm. You know, I found myself having private conversations via text with folks I know who are allies who also work in the field. And to me, the incredible thing and the thing that made me even more committed to writing the book was the level of 
prediction that we had about who this person was. So, you know, I can, not all of this made it into the book, but I can recall numerous conversations I had with friends who said, this is someone who is deeply failed by a police officer. Like, let this story come out. This is someone who is deeply failed. And of course, now we know it's been reported that, you know, the shooter was groomed and allied with uh, a known sex offender who preyed on young boys in the community. We know that he had an uncle who was an RCMP officer who, you know, failed to seize him from his family home when he experienced tremendous acts of violence in the home. And so I think that what's really difficult is that you know, for a long time, I didn't want to write this book because I felt like the really good abolitionist work on homicide needed to happen in private Mm -hmm. because the dynamics of being public about that work really made us martyrs for the cause. And that, you know, you just get absolutely crucified in comment sections. However, um, the amount of, of insight and wisdom that I was finding in these private spaces with folks who work in domestic violence shelters, who have worked in prisons, who are trying to do abolitionist domestic violence advocacy, the level of analysis that we were able to have in private without the intervention of public comment forums was tremendous. And I, you know, I'm nervous to see what's going to come out of the commission, but I'm not very optimistic that it's going to have the same level of nuance. But you know, that's the thing about domestic homicide, intimate partner homicide is one of the most predictable violent crimes we have. The data is so clear on what the risk factors are. And yet we still continue to not really make a dent in rates of domestic homicide. And in fact, the last couple of years, it's been increasing. And so, you know, if that is not an indictment on the role of police and policing, I don't know what is because Feminist research and domestic violence advocacy is just absolutely invested in using police to conduct risk assessment for homicide. Mm -hmm. Police officers are trained in doing questionnaires that come out of of firm and rich and nuanced data about how to predict when someone is at risk for being killed by their partner. And yet we're not seeing those rates go down. Um, And at the same time, though, we're not seeing much of an appetite for non-carceral solutions to dealing with homicide because, you know, some generations of abolitionists, of course, the Canadian Ruth Morris, Canadian Quaker feminist and prison abolitionists wrote about, you know, what do we do with the dangerous few? And I hear that a lot in social movements is that, you know, the argument for, for defunding and abolition is that, well, the majority of folks living in prisons aren't violent and there's a very small dangerous few. Um, that we can probably deal with in other ways. But of course, if we look at the violence enacted by police and we look at rates of intimate partner homicide, the dangerous few are many and multiple. Mm -hmm. And so we really do need to be paying more attention to acts of lethal violence, both by police and those in in intimate partner relations and in a family violence scenario. Yeah. And, you know, if the system isn't working, adopt more radical solutions. I mean, insurgent love uses collusion a number of times to describe carceral feminism's reliance on policing and punishment for expediently getting justice. That that collusion, you write, quote, perpetuates the racist myth that police keep keep us safe from family violence and forgets the white supremacist origins of violence. You say, you know, that carceral feminists have have failed to provide, quote, intersectional analysis that draws connections between white supremacy, um, pervasive anti-blackness, and strategic neglect. Um, And I I wanted to ask, why was collusion for you the precise right word? You even call it uncritical collusion. Um, What are the implications, I guess, of like that specific description of carceral feminism as sort of colluding with, um, yeah, a carceral state? Yeah, I mean, Beth Ritchie has talked a lot about how, you know, the the collusion of white feminism with carceral systems really led to, you know, we have whole nonprofit industries. Of course, the, the context is a little bit different in Canada than in the United States, but using only a, like a singular carceral lens to frame how we're going to intervene in family violence is kind of necessary for the job if you are a feminist who wants to rise up through the ranks and get a job as an executive director 
as a policy advisor. If you want your research to make sense and be received well in conferences, if you're a scholar on domestic violence research, I mean, try being an abolitionist scholar on domestic violence research in Canada. Hmm. It's tough. Mm-hmm. You know, you really, the few of us who are doing this work are often find ourselves very alienated in the field. But there's also the burden of grief um, for those who are working in the field that find that, and you know, I'm allied with a lot of folks who do work in shelters, who work in policy, policy related fields within the government who are abolitionists and struggle to one, try to feed themselves and keep their jobs and push abolitionist frameworks in the spaces that they're in. But there's a feeling of grief at the, at the continued failure of the systems that we know aren't working. And for myself and a lot of my collaborators and my allies, part of that grief, especially around Porta Peak, was knowing that the shooter had an almost identical family history in many ways to Mark Lapine and the Montreal Massacre. Right. However, we still continue to see, and these are you know, well-funded Canada research chairs, for example, that are pushing a kind of research and hashtags on Twitter that say, call it femicide. We need to understand the killing of women and girls. We need to collect data only based in some cases on biological sex, because some of these spaces in intimate partner homicide research are very uh, trans exclusionary. Um, So we continue to see this push in this second wave white feminist circles to completely bracket out one boys who are victimized and often lose their lives at the hands of a violent parent, usually a man, but by only counting the data, on how women and girls lose their lives in the context of broader structures of misogyny in society, we're completely failing to pay attention to the fact that the cycle of violence and the cycle of homicide relies upon those frameworks. So had we have had more critical, nuanced ways of of understanding family violence 15 years ago, if we'd been more willing to pay attention to how men's violence against men cause homicide and acts of lethal violence, we might not have had the Porta Peak shooting. But we continue to sort of beat our heads against the wall and say, you know, hashtag call it femicide, the killing of women and girls, but we're not drawing the links to the characteristics of the perpetrators of these forms of lethal violence and the perpetrators of these lethal forms of violence, both police and those who mimic police when they go on shooting sprees, they all have very similar psychological characteristics. And when we look at them, you know, from a forensic psychological perspective and from the perspective of the sort of spaces that they create and the tactics that they use, we can't not draw the links back to societies that worship police, that worship the military, that reify acts of state violence. And we've had numerous opportunities to do this, but, you know, largely second wave carceral white feminism has taken up positions of power and has a lot of resources within those fields that should be critiquing police as our only way to intervene in family violence. Yeah. And I mean, you articulate it so like convincingly in the book, this idea that reducing it to a women, women's issue ignores the intersection of risks and quote, role, the roles of racism, homophobia, class, and cis normativity in the in the creation of the conditions for this kind of violence, um, but you know to to uh, address I think like before we get you know too deep into it without you know crediting the roots of of your thinking, um, you know you recently posted a Twitter thread on your sense of how to responsibly ethically teach abolition, and you foreground the need to credit Black feminist scholars and activists, noting that quote there's a lot of great new writing on abolition. But there's also a frustrating trend of writing about abolition without once paying homage to the origin of most of these ideas in Black feminist work. This is unacceptable. You say you want to teach your students to consistently say the names of Black and Indigenous feminist abolitionists, to know their names, to credit their work, to have respect, to unlearn the way that celebrity culture erases elders and erases the complicated history of social movements. In the book, you know, you decry the way that these radical concepts have been reduced to credentials and and depoliticized webinars, which is, you know, I think especially the case during the pandemic when we're separated from one another, but desperate for this insight. Why is it important to not just distinguish between, as you do in the book, transformative and restorative justice, but to also recognize the roots of these ideas in, you know, the people who devise them? 
Yeah, I think a lot of my thinking on that in terms of how to be an ally, how to be a white settler, a queer white settler doing work on abolition means acknowledging that I'm a permanent student of Black feminism and Indigenous feminism. And Eileen Morton Robinson's work on the white possessive logic and the ways in which the, the entire founding logic of settler colonial states perpetuates itself even in our radical movements and our radical spaces in the way in which white scholars also other white feminist scholars take up abolition in depoliticized uh, anti-historical ways and so you know i think often social movements do by necessity have to talk about radical concepts and ideas in sound bites that are going to be received well by the public you know i think that radical mm-hmm. movements often have to fight a bit of a pr battle and that mm-hmm. that means that we sometimes have to boil things down in simplistic terms, but then the slippage happens when we see folks, you know, rising to power or getting positions within institutions that have traditionally been very carceral by talking about abolition. And of course, we know this, we know this through institutional ethnography. We know this through radical social movements who tell us that, you know, often these terms and these movements just get cannibalized and spit out the other end of carceral institutions that are happy to install someone in a position of power who uses the right terms, but not actually do the intensive work required in unraveling the way in which carcerality has created those institutions. And certainly I see that in in academic publishing. Um, I think that, you know, the nature of scholarship is that it's rewarded to be an opportunist. We are rewarded for taking credit for other people's ideas. And of course there's, incredible work out there on citational politics. Catherine McKittrick has some really great work on this, Sarah Ahmed. But for me, when it comes down to how to position my work and how to position the importance of these concepts in within the domestic violence research industry, within nonprofit industrial complex that seeks to respond to the work of survivors, I think it's really important to be historical and to point out how long Black feminists have been making the kinds of critiques that we still need today. And we're not going to somehow overnight listen to those critiques because, you know, there was widespread protest in 2020 after the killing of George Floyd. I think what we need within at least I say I align myself a little bit with the nonprofit industry because I have worked in it before and I continue to sort of work as a volunteer on boards and that sort of thing. Um, I think we have to work to make sure that we are reading the books. You know, Angela Davis's book, Our Prisons Obsolete, it's like 112 pages. It's not, we're not asking folks to get a PhD in the history of black feminism, but if you're talking about abolition and you know, you've never read the work of Mariam Kaba. You've never, you know, connected the dots back to how any of those things apply in Canada. Um, I think we need to, to just be a little bit more attentive to the way that that white possessive logic means that we are going to gain power in this small historical moment where abolitionist thought is more accepted in mainstream society. Um, it involves continually making sure that we're reaching as far back as we can so that the current moment is as much tied to the history of these ideas so that we can go in the right directions with it. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we're in a sort of pivotal moment where it does feel as though that kind of co-optation is is happening and there's there's pushback, uh, meaningful pushback at the same time. Like, you know, you mentioned Sarah Ahmed. I think, you know, the pushback is coming from uh, different directions. Yeah, I I was reminded in in, um, reading your book about, you know, how how Ahmed, you know, herself writes about realizing that like a more vital life as a feminist killjoy awaited her if she embraced like more immediate forms of communication, like blogging. Um, and in, in terms of your use of Twitter, you know, to engage with crises in real time, I thought it was interesting that in the book, you know, there's a deprioritizing in some ways, as you've already mentioned, of your specific voice, your theoretical rigor, you know, the book singularity. But there's also a moment in the book where you wonder aloud to the reader, why am I writing a book? And suggest that you you wish instead that you could just project your Twitter feed in the sky like the bat symbol, <laughs> <laughs> which it, like that moment grows out of a, a a a feeling of of sort of desperation or despair where you're you know you're you're raging against the coverage of testimony around the Desmond murders, um, but you're also sort of as I say like subverting the esteem of the book 
Um, and like, it's interesting that you invoke the bat symbol too. Um, and, and know in writing that, that, that comment, that it's going to universally be understood. Like it's, that itself is almost indicative of a kind of education in the righteousness of heteropatriarchal violence and revenge. But your Twitter feed as a replacement bat symbol somehow queers all of that for me. Um, what's your like current relationship to the power of that sort of immediate conversation? Do you see it being this kind of double-edged thing or? Yeah. I, I, and I've had a, I've had a really complicated relationship with, with being public about abolitionist ideas and domestic violence, because, Mm -hmm. you know, as I said, some of the really great abolitionist work on homicide and severe violence has to happen in private. Um, because the, the, the reactionary first wave of affect that comes from the public is often extremely unhelpful to those who are standing at ground zero in the wake of a tragedy or a violent act. This is extra complicated with family violence because often victims are the partner and the children, but they still love the perpetrator very much and have very complicated feelings. You know, there's this very binary understanding that we have in settler culture where someone is either right or wrong, good or bad. But of course, family violence clears all of that, where you can be deeply in love with and deeply understanding of someone who also poses a risk to your very survival. You can be terrified of someone and love them very much. And this is even more complicated with child victims or elder victims where, you know, in the case of Desmond, uh, the, the Desmond murders, that his mother was at risk, right? Mm-hmm. And so these these relationships are so complicated that I do think a lot of what we have to do in community has to be private and has to be protected in that way. But on the other hand, I do think that, and Twitter especially has a way of doing real-time intervention to steer the course of conversations. Because one of the things that I think is really liberatory about it is there's a lot of folks who don't have confidence jumping into these complicated debates about justice and safety, Mm -hmm. but they feel very validated when someone else does and someone else asks the questions that they want to ask. And they sort of have this immediate feeling of relief. And I know I definitely had that as a, you know, as a young scholar and as a young activist where there was so much that I wanted to say and I didn't have my words. And, you know, someone stands up and interrupts a meeting and says, Hey, I want to draw attention to this. And you have that feeling where, you know, you're flipping through the radio channels and everything is static and all of a sudden something becomes clear and you land on a voice of clarity. And I think that it's, it's a tough balance figuring out what kinds of transformative justice work we need to do in deeply unsafe and deeply tragic situations, how much of that can be public and try to be strategic about being public in ways that are generative more than they are harmful. Hmm. That's yeah. Well, I mean, well put. I that's a lot to kind of take in. Um, it it reminded me of how in the book's introduction, you write that it's quote easy to feel like the world is naturally dangerous. Like that to me is mm-hmm. is tr- very true. You know, it's something that people increasingly feel, especially in times of eroding social trust and social cohesion. But like you're connecting that to our reliance on these overarching ideas that have taken kind of hold in the mainstream, like rape culture, you know, to, to engage with the proliferation of gender-based violence. And the point for you is to stress that quote, it doesn't have to be this way. And I like, I so appreciate how your book dwells with the difficulty of engaging with these issues without ever really going into like a hopeless or cynical or too expedient place. You, you're admitting in the book that, quote, untangling ourselves from the forces of occupation is not an easy task, but you never succumb to defeatism and, and instead are trying to pressure us to imagine um, how our subject, our very subjectivities are colonized and, and a way out. And, and it seems to me like against the myopia of carceral feminism, your book insists that, um, you know, we, we think past easy notions of just misogyny being at the core of all forms of gender-based violence, for example, and, and incorporate just an understanding of settler colonial cosmologies. Like to me, that is so powerful for moving us away from a conflict between the co- sort of hashtag not all men versus hashtag yes, all women, you know, thing of these competing hashtags that represented kind of two reactionary responses to 
uh, the Isla Vista shooters rampage specifically. You know, it, the book basically is arguing that the most dangerous forms of intimate violence echo, as you say, patterns of early colonial violence um, that, you know, are about securing possession. And, and you say, in fact, misogyny is an effect of settler colonialism. I wonder if you could speak to that. Like, why does that feel like such a crucial corrective? Yeah. And I mean, I can't take credit for those ideas. Those ideas, you know, came from Black and Indigenous feminisms. But for me, it's it's a corrective that has not been made convincingly in the spaces of power, in, in white feminist spaces of power. And so I am increasingly terrified by the collusion of white feminist work on intimate partner homicide and fascist transphobic violence that's happening, for example, in the United Kingdom, which is which is infiltrating and really seeping into Canadian spaces and Canadian scholarship and especially scholarship on and around domestic violence and intimate partner violence. And so, you know, it, it's a crucial corrective to say to, to stop the conversation and say, OK, hashtag call it femicide. Fine. It's femicide. Many women and girls are killed because they are women. But why? Well, men did it. But why? <laughs> it's like I feel like a toddler in these spaces where I just am asking why over and over and over again. And what you see often is the the white feminist refusal to acknowledge the racist and colonial roots of a lot of that violence. You can see the refusal of how far they're willing to go. And, and it often will not stray into a territory where we have to acknowledge our own complicity as settlers in the perpetuation of that kind of violence. Um, and you know, when it comes to defeatism, I do think, you know, I don't want to moralize courage too much in trying to do this work. I know lots of abolitionists who are totally burnt out and feel defeated. And there were times in the in the period of writing this book that I, I was entirely defeated and I didn't want to write the book and I decided I wasn't going to. Um, but, you know, I think what definitely brought me back to feeling like we needed to have these conversations, it was a matter of life and death, was was my anger over how an intimate partner homicide happened in my closest intimate social circles and just the the absolute madness of being able to predict it, to say, I have a really bad feeling that Nicholas Butcher needs to go to counseling for intimate partner violence. And having friends say, well, there's no violence in that relationship. He's not a violent guy. You know, Kristen's never said there's violence. But to have that knowing that it was going to happen and the feeling of powerlessness. Yeah. And then to have it happen. So if if we are able to prevent death and we don't. So I think that feeling defeated in the face of that is part of the process. You know, and ultimately the reason I didn't stay there is because of my anger. And there were times that I did actually question, like, am I an abolitionist? Because I've had difficulties sometimes with the way in which intimate partner violence is framed in some writing about transformative justice and abolition, because there's we've done a bad job in the domestic violence research industry of educating the public about the different types of intimate partner violence and how, you know, as Michael Johnson calls it, intimate par- terrorism, or Evan Stark calls it coercive control, how different that is from other forms of domestic violence, which are more common and less likely to end in, in homicide. And so, you know, I did, I felt complicit in being part of a world where I wasn't educating the people in my life on how family violence could look really different and how these typologies, however imperfect they may be as concepts, they are really useful for helping us to understand risk. Um, but you know, as I sat through Nicholas Butcher's trial, sort of angrily tweeting about the overwhelming misogyny and complicity of his peers, of my friends, and enabling, you know, the forms of toxic masculinity that led to that crime happening. You know, I'm sitting here sort of wishing in one courtroom that he gets sentenced to a million consecutive life sentences because I'm so angry, even though I'm an abolitionist. And then literally in the neighboring courtroom, My buddy Al Jones and Todd McCallum are there doing work on the Randy Riley murder trial, which is the the murder of a pizza delivery guy, where the court was so focused on putting a black man in jail for that crime that when someone else took the stand and admitted that they did it, the jury still found him guilty. So in one courtroom, there's this terrible racist miscarriage of justice happening. And in the courtroom I'm sitting in, 
there's such an openness to believing that this white man who killed his girlfriend, tried to kill himself and then called the police on himself somehow wasn't responsible. Mm -hmm. I mean, those, it's like a lot of complex things happening all at the same time. So on one hand, I was feeling like the whole system was just so fucked, but I still also really wanted him to burn in hell. And that's where, you know, there's this great piece. I believe it was Miriam Cabin. I can't remember the second author called, you know, abolition is not your fucking feelings. Mm -hmm. I think was really helpful for me in making it feel okay to want revenge in that sense to really to have those vengeful feelings and to not moralize them or to say well you know i'm a bad abolitionist because i want this person to burn in hell and sit in the prison for the rest of their life i mean i think it's okay to have all those feelings and and working with survivors especially families in ontario and um, one of the folks i interviewed for the book is karen graham who founded the um affected families of police homicide and just the really complicated feelings that a lot of those families have when their loved ones are killed by police and they want to hold them accountable, but then they have to use other police and the same miscarriage of justice system to hold them accountable. I mean, it's complicated. Um, yeah, no. Yeah. And the way you express it in the book, like, you know, you say it's fucking complicated. You say the shit is complicated. There's something like cathartic and not academic or sterile about stating the complexity of it. Like, and and it's embodied there's something like deeply embodied about your experience of of um of domestic homicide and i was i was hoping that you'd be open to letting me ask about what it means to be in proximity to domestic homicide because you know for several years i and i take the point that it's not about our feelings it's about maybe our, uh, our sense of responsibility um but you know for several years i was closely associated with owen nelson through a family member. And I, I can even hear myself in how I'm saying it, distancing myself from him. Um, as I'm sure you know, Nelson recently pled guilty to manslaughter and the death of Karen McKenzie. Um, and in the book, you write that, quote, surviving family members of perpetrators may feel responsible for enabling the violence or not responding to warning signs. We were all aware of Owen's possessiveness and volatility, but more or less downplayed or ignored it in the same way that the police did. I mean, Mackenzie called 911 in April 2017 and told them she had been choked and thought that Nelson would kill her. He got probation and was ordered to seek counseling and avoid alcohol to not come into contact with Mackenzie. But, you know, that was it. My immediate instinct um, was to radically distance myself from ever knowing him. And yet, you know, the family of the victim expressed more empathy than I could muster. They said in the courtroom that Nelson, quote, did not choose to carry the pain inside that causes such behavior, but they at the same time could not forgive him. You know, so like it's all so fucking complicated to process. And your book, this notion of insurgent love offers, I think, a way of processing the roots and the aftermath of violence in all of its complexity. You know, I wonder to what extent you feel, I guess, that so much of the work of of transformative justice is about dwelling with the quote mess and contradiction of interpersonal violence. And, you know, like, what did you mean in, in this context when you wrote that quote settler cultures have extremely low emotional literacy and lack the language for complexity? Like how does that kind of come in here too, if that makes sense? Yeah, I, I definitely, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that, uh, I'm sorry that you experienced that tragedy. Um, that's not okay. I saw it unfolding in the lives and, and the relations of folks that I'd known for 20 years who were from, in some cases, quite religious settler backgrounds, um, Christian settler backgrounds, and also some Shambhala Buddhist families who were, of course, white settlers who took up Shambhala Buddhism for, you know, whatever reason, but it continued to sort of be a bit of a vessel of neoliberalism and, and whiteness in the way in which it structured their moral reasoning. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think that we, it's the, it's the legacy of settler colonialist fetish that we have for, for rationality and non-emotional ways of processing. I think 
you know, most feminist historians and, and most students who've taken a first year course in sociology, gender studies or whatever in the university system could could tell you that. I mean, that's that's part of the gender binary that was taught and maintained by European colonial constructs where, you know, we identify complex emotions or difficult emotions with being uncivilized. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a strong class component to the way that that we moralize justice. And it's so different from, you know, rural family members of mine who, you know, also I'm, I'm, I'm close to folks who live in rural areas who have been at ground zero of some pretty awful tragedies in, in some cases where the victims were minors as well. And in, in rural, more working class communities, I think that there was more of, a, of an ability to be angry and to process some of the complex emotions. But of course, vigilante violence, like I, I talk about the Philip Boudreaux case in the book, revenge killings are more common than the media would have you believe, especially in rural places that are under-policed, which is, of course, also part of the carceral state, that there's it's very political who is protected by the police and why and where. Um, and so, you know, I think that developing emotional literacy also requires us to, to unbox and reclaim the tools that forensic psychologists use. A lot of the practices that are out there that we have to responding the toxic accumulation of white supremacy in our psyches, a lot of those tools remain professionalized and credentialed in the practice of forensic psychiatry and forensic psychology. And I think that we need to claim them back rather than just, you know, throwing those disciplines altogether out the window because, you know, I do, I do have allies and, and there are abolitionist sympathizers out there who work directly with some pretty scary folks with some really interesting tools that I think us as communities could be using, you know, if we had different demands around how we wanted to promote community-based mental health and promote emotional literacy and to what extent we want to rely on the school system to help deliver some of those objectives or to rely on you know networks of communities. And I think that um, having stronger mental health literacy and stronger emotional literacy is going to be something that's it can't only happen within one jurisdiction. It can't just be, you know, a municipal program in a community center. It really requires all of us to become to become students of work that white supremacy has systematically erased. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you talk in the book about the siloed nature of clinical, psychiatric, and psychological treatments, and how that produces these barriers that it sounds like you're saying need to come down, and and come down perhaps through this practice of insurgent love, like. There's a definition in the book of how an insurgent love would run counter to ideals of subservience and martyrdom, which I found extremely um, resonant. Like there's this idea that love shouldn't be equated with selflessness and self-sacrifice, and that we should love others by establishing self-protecting boundaries, maybe, so that people who are hurt and who hurt as a result can grow in a different direction, as you put it. Um you know, I, I, re, I was reminded of this recording uh, that was recently um, recovered of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1964, saying that the kind of nonviolence he advocates implies um, a love that is about understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill, and these sorts of transformative things. But, you know, in, in the book, you narrate the remarkable number of experiences that you've had with people who have actually committed acts of violence. And you're, you're like trying to make it clear that, you know, it's it you would tend to violence for personal as well as like ethical political reasons. Could you maybe speak to this idea that you develop in the book that says coercive control is political? Yeah. So for listeners who who aren't as familiar with the different types of family violence, so situational couple violence is the most common form where, you know, violence often erupts as in reaction to stressors in the relationship um, related to attachment issues and other stuff that's going on in the family. So these are highly tumultuous relationships. However, they're very different from, say, a course of control or intimate terrorist relationship, which is like the kind of thing that folks in women's shelters do a lot of education about. It's like the sort of villain you see on a made-for-TV movie. They the ex-husband yeah. who stalks you for a decade in absolutely terrifying and chilling ways. Mm-hmm. Um, and those types of relationships have a high degree of control and coercion. But sometimes 
no degree of physical violence. And this is the really difficult thing. Um, and what, what distinguishes that type of relationship is it's a strategic form of violence and abuse that is deployed, you know, at the surveillance, um, forms of physical violence, that sort of thing are deployed to gain total control um, and objectify a partner as the object of control in reaction to the other partner's distress. Whereas in situational couple violence, the violence is not always strategic. It's usually in the, in, in reaction to a stressor within the relationship or outside. Um, and so coercive control, having worked with men who have been incarcerated for, for both types of violence, a coercive control abuser is, is, is structured a little differently in terms of how they respond to distress. And they are structured very similarly to how police officers are trained to operate. And so violence was used in the found, the early founding of the settler state of Canada. It was used strategically because Mounties were outnumbered, right? And so the way that you gain control of territory from the residents of that territory is to try to use violence in ways that create a culture of terror and fear, which is the same sort of culture of terror and fear that exists in families where there is a course of control abuser or an intimate terrorist. And so, you know, I think that distinct, distinguishing the two types of violence as very different, I think is also important for social movements because, you know, a lot of folks in radical abolitionist circles will, are very quick to do an accountability circle for someone they know is abusive, but they would never do one for a dangerous cop. Mm -hmm. So we would react against that. But when we are, when we are trying to work in community with course of control abusers, we, we have to consider them as like cops. They are as dangerous and they have a similar structure in their psyche that makes it incredibly difficult to use some of those really great tools we have already to deal with abusive behavior in community. And doing that work is also really dangerous. It's incredibly dangerous. And, you know, part of what I'm hoping the book will do is intervene in these very neoliberal expectations often that, you know, white anarchist radicals have is that, you know, we're going to end domestic violence and all the work is going to be done for free. And the first people we're going to approach to be a part of this work is going to be queer, black or indigenous women. And I've, I've actually gotten emails before that I was CC'd, you know, on a book project from someone saying, oh, we're looking to speak to all the queer, black and indigenous feminists who are part of this project to help us uh, hold accountable someone else that you're working with. And so, you know, yeah. I want to intervene in this tendency we have of expecting that labor to be free, of discounting the expertise that some folks have in the nonprofit industrial complex and have in the mental health system um, and trying to make strategic and specific demands about how we access that expertise on how to work with very dangerous abusers. Um, and I think that that can come in handy too, if we know what to ask for and when, and we're able to assess the risks of who we try to deal with in community and how, we also can have programs for demilitarizing and transitioning police officers out of policing and into mm -hmm. community work that reduces their risk of reoffending either as domestic violence abusers in their own homes or you know, maintaining that policing mindset in other institutional spaces they may be in if they choose to leave policing as a career. Yeah, I mean, the book is a kind of gift in a sense. It is, um, you know, it is the kind of book that if you can spend time with it, um, it it will, I think, reshape uh, a lot of the ways that people think. And like, there's one moment in the book that I, I won't take too much more of your time. I just kind of had one more question that comes out of what you were just saying. Like, there's a moment in the book where you write that quote: "You can't collaborate, <clears throat> can't collaborate for justice with your abuser when they bring a gun to the table." And you're specifically talking about um, a police officer that approaches one of these, um, you know, meetings armed. And it reminded me of the strange moment where HRM Central Library was insistent that um, Alex Kishnabish um, include the voices of police officers during a screening of a film on police violence at the library as part of the Radical Imagination Project. Kashnabish made it clear that he was not going to allow that, and he explained why. And your book also leaves no room, really, in a sense, for the police to provide 
this neutral account of themselves. It doesn't even suggest that the police need to be more often held accountable per se. It's it's arguing that it has to be abolished. And I wanted to maybe use this as an opportunity to kind of um, amplify the importance of the recently released defunding the police, defining the way forward mm-hmm. uh, for HRM report, um, you know, which talks about detasking, retasking the police. It, it's a crucial public document. I also, I guess, wanted to reference this recent CBC article that shows that the only group that doesn't, in fact, support detasking and defunding the police are white men. Um, People, 54% do not support it. Um, These are people who are historically in a position to rely on coercion and control to reproduce existing power relations. Um, so I guess my question isn't, you know, it, it is not, why do you think the demographic data on who supports the report skews that way? That seems a little bit obvious, I suppose. Maybe it's not, but, um, less obvious to me are the roots of that sympathetic ro- worldview, I guess. Like, is it partly just attributable to identification with the sources of state violence rather than its victims? Or in your words, the fact that police and military personnel are upheld as symbols of heteropatriarchal valor. You know, I think here about the judge in the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse pausing to force an entire courtroom to salute a veteran for his service. Like, what is going on in terms of mobilizing the public to not just the police, but the public to um, reinforce the importance of this particular report? Yeah. You know, sometimes I wake up in a cold sweat at night and I think what if we're successful defunding Mm. Um, because as we saw in Solniaville and in the the violence enacted by white fishers upon Mi'kmaq fishers from Speganegadi who were enacting their treaty rights to fish in St. Mary's Bay in the absence of police we will just have white men with guns doing the exact same thing Um, and there's a high degree of public acceptance of their violence. And, you know, we can call it vigilantism, but we should also acknowledge that that's the status quo. And I think part of my my desire to connect our understanding of family killers and intimate partner killers with being the same category as police is to help us think through how and where policing exists outside of just who the police officers are and what their budget is because we can reduce the budget for Halifax regional police. And that would be a win. And I I don't argue that that would be a win, but we still have a strong public appetite for white men taking justice into their own hands to protect territory that they claim to own. Um, And so, you know, in the same way that we saw the white fishers bring guns and Molotov cocktails to attack indigenous fishers who were well within their treaty rights to get in the water with a small number of boats. That's the same sort of possessive objectification of the ocean that a coercive control abuser has over their partner. It's a sense of entitlement to own and control and dominate and possess. And I think that, you know, going along with our untangling and defunding and detasking of police is we need a really uh, a better barometer and a strong set of tools to help us acknowledge all of the spaces where, you know, as Eileen Morton Robinson's pointed out, this logic of white possessiveness permeates really deeply. And I think that those are the roots. And we saw this with the Port of Peak killer who it became known after the massacre that he had literally swindled folks out of their property in the same way that the Canadian state used deception and fraud to swindle indigenous nations out of property during the founding of the Dominion of Canada. Mm-hmm. And so those those sorts of behaviors are rarely seen as scary or as connected to policing, but they are an extension of policing in broader society. I don't know if I'm doing a, a good job of answering your question, but I think that, you know, as someone who's really invested in working in community with the dangerous few, we need to disarm and we need to disarm rural areas because as much as Canada likes to to pat itself on the back and say, you know, we're different from police, we don't have as many guns, we have a very high rate of firearms per capita, especially in rural areas. Mm -hmm. Whether they're legal or illegal, whether they're long guns or handguns, it doesn't make much of a difference if you are living with a coercive control abuser who's using one to threaten you 
or whether you're someone trying to exercise your treaty rights at the barrel of a, of a white fisherman's gun. Hmm. No, I think that certainly answers my question, um, but it also stresses um, how complicated something like transformative justice really is. It's not just about winning. Um, it's, it's, it's telling that you wake up in a cold sweat imagining what it would mean to win, right? Um, because then you would have to adapt to a mode of creating an entirely different system. Um, so I think, yeah, uh, your, your book is, is uh, really, um, I think, an important intervention. Um, and it's, it's very rewarding in a way to, to have that experience, to have that book there. So thanks for putting it out into the world. And thanks for talking to me. Thanks so much, Scott.